Welcome to our first lecture in which we're going to be covering um, the uh, topic of national origin discrimination. So let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about how uh, the demographic changes in the United States can sometimes affect um, the uh, instances of national origin. We're going to look at how national origin cases are litigated. We're going to put special attention on English only policies because uh, those sometimes become an issue in national origin cases. We'll also briefly talk about a national origin harassment and OFCCP claims. Um, of course, that is part of the affirmative action um, aspects of um, the law when a particular employer is a federal contractor. And we'll talk about IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. We'll talk more about this statute when we are also covering um, uh, immigration related issues in a separate module. And finally, we'll talk about Section 1981. So let's begin. As we know, the United States is a really diverse place. People from all over the planet come to the United States. Um, and certainly people who've been here, uh, Native Americans, uh, for, for thousands of years. And so um, that's one of our strengths, but it can also be a source of tension in the workplace and elsewhere. Um, as a general rule, any decision that is based upon race or national origin is going to be unlawful. And the primary statutes that we think about for this topic is, of course, Title VII and the IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act. So let's get started. Um, our divorce de our, uh, uh, demographics currently are that we're about 18% Hispanic, about 12% African American, and about 6% Asian. The rest of the population is, um, or most of the rest of the population would be Caucasian. Obviously there's a demographic here that would be uh, biracial individuals and Native American. So, uh, the numbers aren't including every single group, but it gives you a sense that um, those numbers, for example, would have been pretty significantly different, especially with respect to Hispanics and Asians, say 20 or 30 years ago. Those mm -hmm. numbers have increased in part because of immigration, in some cases because family size. A certain ethnic groups uh, tend to have more uh, a larger family, and so that can obviously statistically impact um, that percentage of the population going forward. Um, as a result of these changes in our demographics, we see that there are additional claims of national origin discrimination. It is the fastest growing single category. And so while right now race claims are significantly more common than national origin claims, it may be in the future that national origin claims become a more significant portion of the uh, charges followed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So let's look at how a national origin claim uh, typically kind of uh, begins or, or works its way out. So let's look at national origin discrimination. Okay, so we have a, a defined term here, national origin discrimination protection. So this is a summary about what Title VII effect protections are afforded to people based upon national origin. It is unlawful to limit, segregate, or classify employees in any basis, in any way on the basis of national origin in such a way that would deprive them of privileges, benefits, and opportunities of employment. For whatever reason, we, see, we tend to see more segregation in national origin cases, perhaps because there sometimes are language issues that play a role. And so uh, that's a little bit more of a common issue in this particular practice area than some other practice areas. And of course, we know that Title VII prohibits national origin discrimination. IRCA also prohibits national origin discrimination. You know, it's not unusual that we see the same protections afforded in more than one statute. We especially see that when we look at the state law and the federal law. Oftentimes, we'll see that those two laws may even be word for word the same. IRCA, though, has some important differences with Title VII, and we're going to talk more about IRCA in later portions of the course, but for now, let's just focus on two big differences between IRCA and Title VII. 
The first big difference is that IRCA says we apply when there's only four employees. We know that Title VII starts applying when we have 15 employees. So if you have four up to 14, Title VII doesn't apply to you, but IRCA does. So IRCA kind of extends the scope of Title VII. Of course, IRCA happened after Title VII. Title VII became law in 1964, IRCA in 86. So that's the first big difference between IRCA and Title VII with respect to national origin. The second big one is that IRCA, pro, um, while it prohibits discrimination based upon national origin, it also prohibits hiring somebody who is not lawfully eligible to work in the United States. And so usually those individuals are of a different national origin, almost by definition, right? Because they can't be US citizens, so they've got to be citizens of somewhere else. So they have a different national origin than a native born American, for example. So Title VII does, says nothing about prohibiting anyone from coming to work um, or excluding anyone from employment. So it's interesting that IRCA kind of does two things. It says, we don't believe in national origin discrimination. So anybody's national origin, that person is eligible uh, to be free from discrimination. But we're going to carve out from that protection people who are um, not eligible to work in the United States. Obviously, those individuals still have a national origin, but we aren't going to cover them in terms of protection from employment discrimination. In fact, we're going to tell the employer that it has to discriminate against those individuals. And so IRCA kind of gives with one hand and takes away with the other hand. So if you're thinking about IRCA, I just think about those two kind of, and there are certainly in tension with each other. My guess is that this, these two uh, protections, not protections, but these two aspects of IRCA are an example of kind of the horse trading that happens in, in a legislative body where one side wants is focused on one issue, the other side is focused on another issue, and together they reach a, a common ground. Both sides give a little, that type of idea. Okay, so let's go to our next slide. So this is a definition of national origin. We'll see the definition that Title VII provides in a few minutes. So national origin is an individual's or possibly that person's ancestors, place of origin, that's one category, or it can be the physical, cultural, or linguistic characteristics of an origin group. Um, so, for example, I could be an eighth generation Texan, but perhaps my ancestors in the distant, distant past might have been from Mexico or Spain or Honduras or some other location. So, we, we, I might think to myself, well, gosh, my national origin is the United States. I've been here longer than most uh, Americans in terms of the family. Um, but still, because um, maybe I have a name that reflects an Hispanic culture, or perhaps I have appearance characteristics that perhaps I might be shorter, or I might have dark hair or dark eyes or um, an olive complexion. Those indications that when someone sees me, they say, oh, or they think to themselves, oh, that person is, is Hispanic. Even though my national origin um, in terms of my citizenship is uh, the United States and maybe my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe they are all US citizens. So don't be thrown by the term national origin. Think it has to do with people who've recently arrived. It certainly includes those individuals, but it by no means is limited to those individuals. Sometimes there's an issue about native language. Um, let's say I'm from Vietnam and my first language is Vietnamese. I speak English, we'll say, but it's not the, my preferred language because it's not the one that maybe my brain has been wired to be most comfortable in. Um, I would like to work to speak Vietnamese when I'm with my uh, colleagues at work because we'll say several folks in our particular work area um, speak Vietnamese. Um, so can I be permitted to speak Vietnamese? 
um, or, or can my employer insist that I speak English? Um, the, the right to speak my native language is not guaranteed by Title VII, but we'll talk more as we go through the, this particular um, module about um, how, to what extent an employer can uh, force me to speak English versus another language. So it's a kind of a careful balancing act between my interest perhaps in speaking Vietnamese and my um, uh, employer's interest in having a workplace where people are able to freely communicate with each other. So the United, the United States Supreme Court defined the term national origin, at least within the context of Title Seven issues, is the country where a person was born or from whom his ancestors came. That's a relatively narrow definition, but we'll see the EOC has defined the term more broadly. And you may be thinking, well, which one controls? Does the US Supreme Court's control or does the, the EOC? The US Supreme Court has not given the EEOC historically a tremendous amount of deference. Having said that, um, you'd, I think you'd want to look to see exactly what the reason for the US Supreme Court's definition of national origin was. Um, it may not have been one that was intended to exclude certain categories. And so if that wasn't the goal of the definition, they may well refer to the EEOC language as uh, the controlling uh, language for here. So let's look at the EEOC language. And here we have it. National origin discrimination includes, but it is not limited to, the denial of equal employment opportunity because of an individual's or his or her ancestor's place of origin. So this tracks, this first part, this first bullet tracks very closely with the US Supreme Court language. But we can see we have a, yet another category that we don't see in the US Supreme Court. And that is because an individual has a physical, cultural, or linguistic characteristics of a national origin group. And we'll talk, um, well, well, actually, let's get started talking about that in our next slide so we can see a person can have these characteristics and not fit into this category above. And we'll look at some examples of that going forward. The, one of the big ways that somebody can have a national origin discrimination claim and yet not have ancestors from, a, from that particular national origin can be when they are associated with that group through marriage or some other type of association. So here we have an example. Mary is a white Christian and she's married to Ahmed, who's Iraqi and presumably a Muslim. Uh, Mary has been subjected to verbal abuse almost every day because of her husband's ethnicity. So it has been pervasive enough to be perhaps harassment. Mary has a national origin discrimination claim under Title VII because she's being harassed based upon her husband's origin, a national origin. Now this could be the case simply because um, the, the people at her work know that she's married to Ahmed, or perhaps she's taken on her husband's um, surname. And so it, suggest a Middle Eastern or Arab um, background. And so even though Mary's national origin and her, the national origin of her ancestors isn't from the Middle East, she still could advance a national origin claim. I happen to have a friend who um, it was adopted by Cuban Americans. He grew up in Florida and um, he isn't sure what his national origin is, but to look at him, he doesn't look Hispanic. He looks, uh, um, he has light brown hair and, and I don't know his eye color is, but light, light eye color. He looks what you would think of as, as non-Hispanic European descent person. But his last name is a name that is associated, I'll just say it's Garcia, but it's not, it's not that, but it's a name like Garcia that when people hear it, they immediately think of, oh, he's Hispanic. And so even though uh, my friend probably isn't genetically Hispanic, he um, has, I'm sure, experienced times where he's been subject to discrimination because he, is, um, he has a surname that implies that he might be Hispanic. 
Another way that um, national origin discrimination can arise, again, under the association category, is when a person is a member of a group that is associated with um, a particular um, ethnicity. For example, LULAC or MALDEF are organizations that are associated with the Hispanic community. Now, I don't know what the rules are about being members, but my guess is that you can be a member of those organizations and not actually be Hispanic. And so under those circumstances, I, who am not Hispanic, could join that group, even if I were African American or uh, Korean or whatever my ancestry might be. But you can understand if I put that on my resume, um, a potential employer would probably think, oh, Cynthia Gruber must be Hispanic, or it's very likely to be Hispanic, given the fact that she is a member of this organization. So that I could be subject to discrimination on that basis. I might uh, participate in organizations that are associated with that group. For example, if I attend the Greek Orthodox Church, most people are probably going to assume that my ancestors are from Greece, um, whether they are or are not. If I attend a um, synagogue, people are going to assume that my ancestors are probably Hebrew um, and maybe originally from Israel. Um, so you can see how the, uh, the church that a person attends, especially if it has a significant ethnic connection, the assumption might be that that person is a member of that group, even if they aren't. Maybe I married into that thing, or maybe I converted because it spoke to me. And so I might not be ethnically a member of that group at all. And of course, a person may adopt his or her spouse's name or may be adopted into a family uh, with a particular surname. Or perhaps the surname, for whatever reason, suggests a certain ethnicity when in fact that ethnicity doesn't exist, um, where the people may be of a completely different ethnicity. It just happens to be a coincidence. All of those things can lead to national origin discrimination claims. It is unlawful for employers to hire people based upon their ethnicity because they perceive that their customers would like a person of a particular ethnicity. And uh, as a result of this, um, an employer can't even favor a minority member over a majority member. So for example, some people think, well, when I go to an Asian restaurant, I want the hostess and the uh, waiter to be Asian. And when I go to the Mexican food restaurant, I want the uh, host and the waiter to be Hispanic. There may be some of those expectations. The idea is that that's going to kind of complete the experience. I'm going to feel like, oh, I've just taken a mini trip to Asia. I've just taken a mini trip to Mexico. But the reality is that an African-American or a Caucasian can serve those foods just as easily as a Korean person or a, um, a Mexican-American can. Um, certainly, having the knowledge about the cuisine, being able to pronounce the names uh, with an appropriate accent, all of those characteristics are very reasonable. And it might be that I, the Caucasian, uh, might not have the uh, linguistic chops to be able to pronounce uh, certain words in an authentic manner. That would be a legitimate reason not to hire me. But there could also be Asian people who don't happen to speak that language who also couldn't pronounce those words any better than I can. And there could be Mexican Americans who couldn't do that. So you'd be, have to be sure to be consistent in those respects. Just like with national origin discrimination, national origin harassment is absolutely a thing. Just like when we talk about racial harassment, people can be, uh, can be called uh, negative names relating to their national origin. And we see that um, even amongst groups of individuals who might be Caucasians. For example, when I was growing up, for a time in my life, we lived in Ohio, and there was a pretty tremendous amount of prejudice against people of Polish descent. And there were all kinds of offensive terms that were used and offensive jokes that were made about people who were from Poland. 
And most of the, the, the gist of the jokes were that Polish people weren't as bright as other people, which of course was ridiculous. Um, but those types of jokes, if they still exist, and I'm not saying that they're, that they're anything like as common as they once were, those could be the form of a national origin complaint, even though obviously Polish individuals are Caucasian, they're European descent people. So um, we see that national origin can be defined very narrowly. For example, I'm a French person, or I'm an Italian person, or I'm a Chinese person, or even a specific region within China. Um, or they can be more a broad sense. For example, I'm an Asian person, or I'm a Latin American person. So again, you, you can look at those terms in broader ways and narrow ways. Let me give you an example. There was this case where there was a man who was um, Peruvian. He, was, he had been born in Peru. He was a Peruvian citizen. Both of his parents were from Eastern Europe, and both of his parents were Ashkenazi Jews, meaning they were Eastern European Jews. They had immigrated to Peru um, sometime around World War II. I don't know if it was before or after. And so he had, he had been born after the immigration. He spoke Spanish fluently. He didn't look Hispanic, because obviously his ancestry was um, Eastern European, I don't know if it was Romania or Bulgaria, which country it was, but it was, was one of the Eastern European countries. But culturally, he had many of the characteristics of people from Peru. Certainly linguistically, he had those food choices, I'm sure were similar. Um, the style of dress he enjoyed. Um, I'm sure there were other things that he connected. And then, of course, he had some things from his parents, his religion, um, his physical appearance. And I'm sure that they had some customs there as well. So um, he moved to the United States and he became a professor. Um, he uh, did not have a Latin American last name and either a first or last name that suggested Latin Americanism. And um, so over time, um, his employment became problematic. He uh, was ultimately dismissed from his position. And he filed a charge alleging that his national origin was um, Ashkenazi Jew, um, Eastern European, and Peruvian. And the, the employer said, wait a second, how can you be all of those things? But the reality is you can be, and you can be more than just three, because all of those things were part of his story and could be the basis of discrimination. Um, so many of us have those kind of complicated stories of where our family tree forks and, and weaves and does some other things. So a person isn't limited to just one type of national origin. Let's consider the topic of adverse employment action. Obviously this term, applies to not only a national origin, but any other category of discrimination. Mm -hmm. So any adverse employment action is any action or omission that takes away a benefit, opportunity, or privilege of employment. So it's the, uh, the uh, termination, but it's also the failure to hire, failure to hire being an omission. It's the uh, decision not to promote somebody, or it could be the decision to demote somebody. So it's both the action and the omission. So really, anytime an employer decides to promote one person, in some sense that employer is actually making several other decisions because if I decide to promote Bob, in some sense I'm also deciding not to promote Larry, not to promote Susan, not to promote Luis, and everybody else who was potentially somebody who might be promoted. Um, a, an employer who selectively enforces um, a neutral policy can also be guilty of disparate treatment. So let's consider how that would look. So Bob's an Asian man. He is fired because he was late to work three times. Now the company has in its manual, it says, well, after the second tardy, termination is an appropriate consequence. And so if that employer consistently applies that policy to every single candidate, whether it be an African-American, a Caucasian, or an Asian, then Bob's out of luck. The employer's allowed to have a policy, even if it seems a little draconian. 
Now for this particular policy, there may be issues with FMLA or ADA, but we're just looking at it through the Title VII lens right now. So if the, the employer has been consistent about applying it, it's fine that the employer took an adverse employment action. But let's say the facts reveal that Larry, who's a Caucasian or maybe he's an African-American, has had four tardies, but he's still employed there. Well, then again, that, that idea of that comparator that we've talked about before becomes an issue. The policy is reasonable because as long as it's being consistently applied, but the application of the policies was problematic, that's discriminatory. Now, it doesn't mean that the employer isn't gonna be able to provide an explanation. Maybe Larry has a serious disease and he's protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Or maybe Larry has longer service and so he's covered by the Family Medical Leave Act, whereas Bob is not. Or perhaps um, Larry had some really good reasons why he was late and Bob doesn't. I mean, there can be all kinds of explanations that would allow the employer to make a distinction between Larry and Bob. But just given the fact is presented, the employer is going to have to do some explaining to, to support uh, the, the different treatment. So here are some examples of that adverse employment action. Failure to hire or failure to promote, to demote, to terminate, um, to suspend from employment, to give some kind of corrective action like a, a final warning, to remove privileges that might be afforded to other employees, uh, to move somebody from one shift to another, um, to reduce the number of hours a person works. There's lots of different um, possibilities. One is job assignments. So if um, I am moved, even if it's within the same job classification, if I move from um, a more pleasant, more pleasant tasks to less pleasant tasks, that could be a job action. Here we have an example of that. Um, in this hospital, um, there are five workers of Middle Eastern descent who work in the maintenance department. And there's 20 total maintenance employees, but the supervisor takes five of them, all of the Middle Eastern, and assigns them to the most unpleasant tasks, cleaning the morgue in the basement. They let the supervisor know, hey, we don't like this. We would like to maybe be in a rotation where we do it sometimes, but the other 15 also do it sometimes. Um, when the hospital doesn't make a staffing change or move the folks around, that could be an example of, of unlawful segregation. And it could also be an example of giving less pleasant tasks uh, to one person versus another. You know, we all know that every job has its fun task and it's not so fun task. And so if you uh, take a group of folks and figure out what the least pleasant task is and assign it to a particular person or that, that might be of a particular ethnicity, under those circumstances, the person may not be at any pay, but certainly their, the quality of their work life is diminished. So that can be an adverse employment action for sure. We will use the same disparate treatment and disparate impact analysis that we've used in the past. We use the same prima facie case analysis that we've used when we were talking about race discrimination and color discrimination. So the plaintiff must be a member of whatever the class is, Middle Eastern, Polish, um, Korean, Laotian, um, uh, Lebanese, whatever the category might be that the person was qualified for whatever the position was, that some kind of adverse action happened, failure to hire, termination, whatever it is, and that the, the job was filled by someone outside of the class um, uh, that, that the plaintiff belonged to. And again, there's some flexibility on this last one. This is oftentimes easier for the national origin um, person to be satis to satisfy because um, especially if it's something very specific, like um, I feel like I'm being discriminated against because I'm Scottish. Well, most people aren't Scottish. So probably whoever gets hired isn't going to be Scottish, right? So um, it, it, this, this final option seems to be a little bit easier to make than sometimes in a race case, because after all, 12% um, you know, of our population are African-Americans. 
12% of our population are Polish people. And so it's more likely that the next person who gets hired would be an African American, which would be significantly injurious to my case as an African American plaintiff. Um, another thing that can kind of come up is language fluency. Obviously, sometimes it's important for a particular job that the candidate be a native English speaker. Um, but sometimes it's important that they be able to speak a different language. For example, if I'm hiring a translator, I obviously need that person to be able to speak both languages, the language that they are supposed to hear and understand, and then the language that they are supposed to translate the material into. And so those are obviously requirements for the job, qualifications for the job. Let's consider the example of a French restaurant. Um, this is an expensive French restaurant. The owner of the restaurant, Henri, wants to make sure that his customers have an immersive experience. That's perfectly appropriate. You know, he puts a picture of the Eiffel Tower on the wall. He makes sure as much as possible the restaurant feels like a French bistro. Um, he does that, of course, with respect to the menu and the quality of the food, but also with the ambiance, the lighting, the music, as much as possibly tries to replicate that experience. Well, when he hires people, he would like to hire people who can um, uh, speak French, so that, because uh, many times, perhaps Henri is expecting that some of his customers will be French speakers, or at least they'll want to dust off their high school French and say a few words in French. Also, perhaps the menu is in French, or at least it may be partially in French. And so Henri will want the, the customer, excuse me, the waiters to be able to translate it to the uh, guests who are not fluent in French. And uh, Henri will want the, uh, the waiters to be able to say it in a way that communicates the beauty of the French language. Well, all of that is very reasonable. What would be unreasonable, though, or at least unlawful under the law, would be to say, well, Henri can then just hire people who are native French speakers or people who are from France. And he can't do that, but he certainly can uh, put as one of his requirements that the person be able to speak fluent French. Accentless French? No. He can't expect them to speak French like a Parisian, but he can expect them to be able to uh, speak. Uh, fluently to be able to make themselves easily understood in French and to understand others. In many cases, that's probably going to be a French person, but it may be in some cases someone from Haiti or some other part of the world or, or somebody that's just learned French. So you can't, just like, you, just like we can't uh, limit our hiring at the Mexican food restaurant to Latin Americans, we can't restrict our French restaurant hiring practices to people from France. So we have this idea of members of the protected class. Let me go back here. We, we have this for the uh, prima facie case category. We have to be a member of the class. So again, when we're talking about the protected class, we're not just talking about citizenship. We're talking about country of origin, which may be several generations back. So Title VII really has nothing to do with citizenship. We're not talking about aliens here, although we do talk about that with respect to IRCA, as I said before. Uh, so really, Title VII isn't focused on, well, what's your citizenship? It's focused on when your ancestors are. Now, you may not be a U.S. citizen. For example, if I were born in Mexico, I might move to the United States, be eligible to work in the United States, and still be a citizen of Mexico. Or maybe I become naturalized and become a citizen of the United States. Or maybe my ancestors moved to the United States four generations ago, and I, I don't have any uh, legal ties to Mexico at all. So national origin encompasses both the plaintiff's place of birth, as well as those ethnic characteristics. As we said, we can have a surname reflecting a place of origin, even if it doesn't end up really reflecting anything else about us. So again, the national origin incorporates the physical, linguistic, or cultural traits. 
Now, sometimes an issue comes up, well, what if we have an employee who wants to wear a particular item of clothing that is very meaningful to him or her, that reflects his or her culture? Um, I'm gonna give somewhat of, an, of a silly example, but let's say, um, I have some family ancestry. If I were to wear lederhosen to work, I mean, people would laugh at me, clearly. People don't even do that in Germany, I'm not sure enough. Oompa band or something like that. But let's imagine that I wanted to do that. My employer could say, no, Ruber, you can't do that because that doesn't meet our dress code. Now, if it does meet the dress code of the employer, then I would be allowed to wear my later hose. But um, if it doesn't, then they can tell me, no, it doesn't work. Now, sometimes national origin and religion can be connected to one another. So for example, if I were Middle Eastern, let's say I, I were Iraqi, um, you know, most Iraqis are Muslim. And so I may not, in my mind, make a lot of a distinction between being Arab and being a Muslim. I may see them as very similar, even though there are Arab Christians and uh, a few other uh, religious groups within the Arab world. But for the most part, most Arabs are going to be Muslim. And so, um, with respect, let's say, again, let's assume that I am an Iraqi Muslim, I may want to wear um, uh, some type of modest clothing, maybe um, a headscarf or something along those lines to reflect my religious aspects. I might think of it as a national origin situation, but I'm not gonna have protection in that area. The way that I would have protection, the, re the way that I would have a right to reasonable accommodation in this area would be if it were part of my religion, and that would be the path. So I don't have the right for a combination of my national origin by the manner of my dress, but I do with respect to my religion, at least to a limited degree. And we'll talk about the, the, the structure of that protection when we get to the religion chapter. Okay, so Mary comes to work in clothes that are highly reflective of her national origin. They also happen to violate the dress code in her place of work. Um, she's asked politely to change. Um, she uh, goes home and changes, and she um, can uh, she conforms to the dress code in her new clothing. Her employer is perfectly within its rights to ask her to make that change. The employer would also be within its rights to allow Mary to wear those clothes. I guess it would depend upon, um, you know, what about the clothing was outside of the dress code. You know, if it were a bikini, for example, um, probably not the best thing for most workplaces unless you're life partner, right? So Bob is the manufacturer of a marketing unit. He issues a written workforce policy, this is a bizarre one, saying that any employee who is related to people of Latin American origin will be ineligible for promotion to supervisory level. Okay, obviously no real employer is gonna do that. Can't imagine more stupid policy, or not too many of them at least. Um, obviously this policy per se violates Title VII. Um, it would discriminate against people who are Latino and Latina, but it would also violate, uh, violate the rights of people who adopt um, Latin American children and who are married to Latin Americans. So Bob is a member of the Maori tribe. I believe that is a aboriginal people from New Zealand, maybe? I'm not 100% sure. Anyway, he wants to become a sheriff, a deputy sheriff in Collin County. He has a few tattoos on his face and nose that reflect his heritage. That's a common uh, thing to, to do in the Maori culture, I believe. Uh, per the dress code, though, uh, sheriffs Sheriff deputies are not allowed to have visible tattoos. And obviously, if they're on your face, they're going to be visible. Uh, so Bob is told he'll need to get his tattoos removed before he can apply. Under those circumstances, probably Collin County can defend its policies. So depending upon how small they are, I suppose Bob could put a bandage over them. Um, but he probably might want to consider uh, if he decides that this is his career path to have them surgically uh, removed. 
Uh, Chao Kong is a uh, employee of Chinese origin. Her supervisor uh, refuses to call her Chung Tao, Chung Tao and calls her Charlene instead. Obviously, that's not the name that she wants to go by, and so she corrects him and says, please call me Chung Tao. Uh, but Bob, the supervisor, continues insisting that she should be Charlene, saying, well, that's going to make the customers more happy. Well, as we said before, customer um, approval is not an acceptable reason for engaging in discrimination under any of our categories. And so uh, Chong Tao would have a claim under Title VII for national origin discrimination. Now I'm going to be honest that while she'd have a claim, she probably isn't going to be eligible for any money if she hasn't been demoted, if she hasn't lost hours, if she hasn't been dismissed. Um, so I'm not saying it's the, you know, it's not like there would be a line of attorney lining up to um, represent Chong Tao in this situation. Um, but you can see how it's it's certainly a violation of law. And let's say in the future, uh, Bob dismisses Chung Tao for some reason. Well, it, it, this piece of evidence that he insisted upon calling her by the wrong name would certainly help her case um, in the, the larger case of wrongful dismissal. Um, as we said before, you always have to, so I guess we're now next to the next goal here. So we've talked about the plaintiff must be a member of the protected class. And then of course the next prima facie case requirement is that the plaintiff must be qualified for the position. And of course that's a part of the prima facie case in all of our examples that we talked about. Um, there can be specific national origin requirements for, for the, the can be legitimate job requirements. And remember that a BFOQ can be an employer defense. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we are, that our, our business is seeking to expand to, um, we'll say India, I'm making stuff up here, so I'm picking a country at random. It could be that if we hire an Indian national uh, to be our spokesperson or our contact in that country, that, um, um, he will be able to um, uh, have certain uh, rights as an Indian that will uh, mean that we will be better positioned. Um, and in our uh, case, in our, our business development. Now I'm not talking about the fact that um, he might be able to uh, be more charming or more personable because he knows the culture and the customs better. I mean that there may be specific legal rights that he has under the laws in, in his country because he is a citizen of that country. Certainly, he may be able to speak the language. Um, and so that could be an important uh, issue. And so sometimes there are some times where it can be a BFOQ that the person be of a particular national origin. As I said before, though, uh, customer and coworker preferences is not a BFOQ. So you can't say, well, we're going to hire an Indian national for our Indian project um, because we think um, he'll be a, a better presence for the Indian customers that we plan on attracting. That won't work. Okay, so Code Z was established right after 9-11. As we all know, 9-11 was 9-11-2001. And this was designed to address um, concerns that existed um, primarily uh, for um, Middle Eastern and Muslim individuals. They were seeing that they were subject sometimes to violent uh, discrimination and harassment. And so we see, we saw in that aftermath, and to some extent we see today, that um, people who perhaps dress to reflect that culture sometimes are discriminated against. Um, and sometimes they can be subject to more stringent security concerns. People may be more uncomfortable with them having certain jobs where they may be perceived of as a greater risk to people's safety. So Dell arrives, for, uh, applies for a job as a, as a bus driver at Dell's 
employer is worried that it may not be safe to allow someone of Middle Eastern descent, such as himself, to drive a bus full of people. So therefore, Abdel is asked to submit to a more stringent background check than other individuals who are, say, Caucasian or Hispanic or African American are asked to undergo. That would be a violation of the law. And so we can't ask for uh, more review of a Middle Eastern candidate or a Muslim candidate than someone else. And so we have to be sensitive and aware that these concerns are out there and that sometimes inappropriate things can get communicated. And one of the things that is so difficult about this type of protection is sometimes, or this type of concern is that sometimes we'll see this with the customers. So let's imagine that Abdel gets the job, he's the bus driver, he's driving the city bus. There are going to be people who get on that bus to um, say offensive things perhaps, or who are concerned because they don't have uh, the confidence that the bus is going to be safe. And so Abdel has to be kept safe in those situations as well. It's not good enough for us to say, well, you know, we don't take who rides the buses. Abdel is entitled to be safe from customers that we, that when he is performing his job responsibilities, we, the employer, are putting him in jeopardy. So we have to be sensitive to those concerns that have down my hair. Let me just for a second show you the EEOC. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the code, code uh, Z um, information is kind of, just, I'll just show you for a second. You can see it came out um, several months after 9-11 and gives a little bit more detail about the concerns that were going on in the community at the time. And of course, many of these concerns continue to this day. Okay, so in order for a successful national origin harassment claim to exist, does the harasser need to know what national origin the person has? You might think to yourself, hello? Although, of course, he's gonna discriminate at someone for the wrong national origin. But this happens all the time. This is not an unusual thing. I guess people who say stupid things really are stupid in some cases. Anyway, the answer is no. In this case, um, Rafiq was the uh, employee. He was born in India. He was a Muslim and he worked in Conroe, just down I-45 from us. His coworkers called him Taliban and an Arab, even though he wasn't. Um, Arab, and he certainly wasn't a member of the Taliban, and they encouraged him to go back to his Islamic country, but of course he was from India, which is not, you know, it's about 10% Muslim, about 90% Hindu. He was ultimately discharged from his position, and he sued. Well, the employer's defense was, we can't be guilty of national origin discrimination because his coworkers were too stupid to know where he was from. Well, that doesn't work. You don't get to discriminate against someone because you don't know who the person is from. It is not necessary, the uh, Fifth Circuit said, for the harasser to correctly identify the national origin group the victim belongs to in order for national origin discrimination to exist. So um, Rafiq still had a claim, even though his stupid coworkers didn't know where he was from. Now we're going to talk about English only policies. So let's first of all discuss accents. Generally speaking, we're not allowed to prefer certain as um, accents over others. We can't say, oh, that's a cool French accent, much more attractive than that harsh sounding German accent. Um, the, the only issue we're allowed to consider is is the accent so strong that it's difficult for us to understand what that person is saying? So comprehension is a legitimate issue, but attractiveness of the accent isn't one of them. So let's imagine that you have a math teacher. Uh, she's originally from a different country. Her English isn't, um, is, is fine. It's, she's fluent in English, but it's very heavily accented. And her students are having difficulty understanding her. Well, in that, in that situation, that would be a legitimate reason to end the employment relationship. 
not because she has an accent, not because she has an unattractive accent, but because she is difficult to understand. And obviously a teacher has to be understood in order for her to do her job. Um, of course, this takes us to another point, which is, well, what kind of jobs require fluency in English? As a general rule, many jobs don't. Um, and to require that people be fluent in English when it is not part of their job responsibilities to communicate in English um, is not permitted. You can't add on, oh, well, we want all of our employees to be fluent in English, even the ones who are cleaning the sinks. Why do you need to speak English to clean a sink? I don't think so. Um, so you, you need to think through it, and before you put a, an onerous job or owner's requirement on those individuals, you think, now why do, would they need to do that? There might be a reason, but in many cases there won't be. Um, so requiring, and, and, and then a separate issue is some employers would prefer to permit English only in the workforce. Everybody who's speaking has to speak in English. Um, this is a really sensitive issue. The people's emotions run very highly on this one. Um, I have been involved in lots of discussions on this over the years in my practice. And so I'm going to share with you some of the things that I have heard. Um, when I represented a salon, um, a, a salon uh, business that had lots of different salon locations, what would sometimes happen is, um, We'll say uh, that the stylist spoke, I'm just going to say, we'll say Romanian, making up a lady, because I don't make up names, but, and, and not surprisingly, many of her clients were from her community. And, you know, a, a stylist is a networker. So when she meets people at her church or synagogue or in her community, she were, you know, suggesting that they come and get their hairstyle um, with her. And so not surprisingly, pretty significant number of her clients would be of her culture and quite possibly speak her language. So when she, the Romanian speaker, is assisting the customer who also speaks Romanian, it makes sense that they're both gonna be speaking you know, Romanian. Why would they speak English when they're just speaking to each other? It perhaps, perhaps is, is easier for them to communicate the language and certainly more comfortable for them to do so. Well, if you are in the next chair and you are, say, an English-only speaker and you see these two individuals talking and from time to time they may be laughing, you may start feeling uncomfortable. Are they laughing at me? Or do they think my hairstyle is ridiculous? Then they may have looked over at you for no reason related to you you or perhaps they are talking about you <laughs> who knows they know you don't speak Romanian so they could talk about you if they wanted to um, sometimes the English only customer is uncomfortable feels left out feels like they maybe are being discussed and so it can make that person uncomfortable as a result some salons really want to say let's just speak English but again, the EOC is going to say, no, we can't have that policy. Um, if the customer prefers language X and the stylist or customer service representative of any type also speaks that language and they choose together to speak that language, uh, the employer cannot interfere with that. It's especially true in the break room when the person is off the clock, is having lunch or a snack. During those times, definitely the employer shouldn't step in and say, oh, this is an English-only break room. Now, again, there can be tensions between coworkers under this situation. If uh, you know, you're an English-only person, you walk into the break room, and everybody's speaking a different language, you're not going to feel very welcome. You're going to wonder, perhaps, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, but some would wonder, are they speaking about me? And you aren't going to feel included. So these issues are very uh, human. They're very much the human condition. And different people are going to react to this in different ways. But we do have pretty clear guidance that when people are assisting customers, they can use language the customer wants, 
And when people are not actively working, they can use language they want. And so it, it does involve, though, some level of sensitivity, um, everybody having for everybody else so that people can um, uh, reduce the tensions in the workplace. When I worked with a retailer, uh, we had a policy. There was, was actually a, uh, uh, this was, retailer was in the Miami area. And the Miami area is, attracts tremendous diversity of, of individuals who speak all kinds of languages. Anyway, um, this particular store had in its um, staff dozens of employees who spoke different languages. I mean, I think there were more than 20 languages represented by this workforce. Of course, English was the most common language, uh, but and of course, Spanish was also very common. Um, and so what happened was the a store developed a, a list of employees with different languages. So when a customer who's oftentimes a tourist uh, visiting the Miami area would come in and, and seem to want, want somebody who spoke that language, then they would look on their list and say, oh, do we have somebody who speaks Polish? Or do we have somebody who speaks Italian? Well, yes, we do. And if that person was, was working that day, then they would find that person and have that person assist the customer. Um, in areas of the country where it's common for there to be a popular second language, oftentimes Spanish, um, uh, the retailer for whom I worked would have a policy that you always greeted the customer in English at first, um, but it was appropriate if it seemed that the customer was not a native English speaker to say, would you prefer that we continue in Spanish? Um, and that could be said in English or Spanish, depending upon the circumstances. And it could be a different language in other parts of the country. Um, that would be a common uh, uh, practice. So there can be another issue too. Let's imagine that um, I'm stocking shelves in this retail store. And I'm putting the, the Levi jeans in a rack or whatever. And I'm working with another coworker. We're both doing it. Um, and as we're working, we engage in small talk, nothing in the world wrong with that. We're both primarily, we'll say, um, uh, French speakers. And um, uh, we have a third worker who joins us, and this worker is English only. And so she is excluded from the conversation because she doesn't speak the language. Now certainly, um, uh, Probably the most gracious thing for us to do at that point, if we also speak English, is to switch to English or to at least end the, the small talk conversation. Um, it's difficult for an employer to enforce that rule, to insist that the Spanish or the French or whatever in at that time, but sometimes talking with people and letting them think, how would you feel if people with whom you were working or talking a different language, which essentially excluded you from the group. And many times talking them through in that respect can cause people to say, oh, okay, I get that. During my breaks, I'm gonna speak the language I want. Um, when I'm just working alone with another person, I can speak that language. But if other people in the group, um, it's my choice, but perhaps I will choose not to speak that language if the other person doesn't understand. Now, employers can sometimes insist upon English only in certain circumstances. And usually this is to maintain supervisory control or also safety issues can be in play here. So if the supervisor is English only, um, then certainly it can make sense that the workers may need to have at least some level of understanding of English so that there can be some communication. Now sometimes this has gotten around by having uh, some workers who are bilingual act as translators. I've even seen it where family members may act as translators um, to allow there to be that communication. Um, safety can also be an issue. Let's say there's a fire in the facility. Well if people don't know um, what fire where the word for fire is in English and the supervisor doesn't know the word in, for fire in the language of the employees, 
that could be a real problem. But you would need more than just fire to communicate. You'd also need to tell the person, hey, uh, you need to go out to the green doors, not the red doors. The red doors are where the fire is. And so there needs to be at least some level of communication uh, there. And so um, that can be approached, though, without having that person be fluent in English. Uh, it would make sense to do some fire drills and to talk through um, with that person. And maybe, hopefully, there's at least one person who speaks that language who also speaks English. So you can develop um, kind of a shorthand or a, a brief uh, vocabulary that will allow you to communicate, you know, danger, fire, um, you know, red door, green door, things along those lines. Tennessee has an English only law. It doesn't change Title VII, and of course it's not relevant in Texas. Um, I'm just showing this to you to see that this is a, a fairly emotional issue in many parts of the country. And so we see that people do feel strongly about English, uh, both the importance of having English only environments and also the importance of having a diverse language environment. So if an employer chooses to restrict, at times, the use of languages other than Spanish, the employer bears the burden that the presumption is that those restrictions are unlawful, that they are national origin discrimination. So the employer has the burden of showing that there is a safety reason or a supervisory reason for that. Um, sometimes you can make the customer service argument but again, usually customer service preference is a weak argument to make. We've seen that you can't use that in hiring decisions of minorities, and so you probably can't use it in English only uh, situations. Let's see if there's anything else. So, uh, the, the rule of thumb is at the end of the day, English only policies are rarely going to be lawful. Um, limiting um, other languages in certain contexts or requiring at least some vocabulary in English might be reasonable if they are narrowly construed. But even there, you ought to think carefully through how would I defend that? How would I support that? What particular reasons would make that? Um, an exception to the overall world that we shouldn't have English only policies. As I said before, the EOC's policy is position is there's a very narrow availability for English only rule based upon business justifications. We need to have this because of the business reason. Those customer factors can sometimes permit. English only on the sales floor. Again, um, when there aren't customers around, I'm not sure that would be defensible, but having the rule when customers are around, I think it, it's something that is in the gray area. It's a little bit legally aggressive. Um, I, I, would, I would want to make sure before I approve that policy, I want to make sure then in that circuit, courts had been sympathetic to that particular issue. But I will tell you that courts generally have been more open to English-only rules than the EOC has been. The EOC has been pretty resistant to permitting any English-only rules. And ultimately, the courts are the ones who have the control. So it's helpful not just to say, well, the, the EOC says this, but also to do some research into the decisions in their jurisdiction. At this point, we've talked about changing U.S. demographics, about how national origin claims develop, and we've also discussed English-only policies. Um, in our next presentation, we'll discuss national origin harassment. We'll discuss the OFCCP claims of national origin discrimination. We'll discuss IRCA in a little bit more detail, and we'll talk about Section 1981. As always, if you have questions about the material, please don't hesitate to pop in. I would love to hear from you. I thank you for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.